Good morning, everyone. And welcome along to our service of worship here in Pomeroy today, to our communion service, uh, which is going to be slightly different in the way that we do things, but nonetheless, the content of the service will be pretty much the same. We, we delight to see you along, joining with us to worship God today and to participate in the Lord's Supper. One or two things uh, just that I will highlight. Uh, the announcements have been uh, rolling there before the service began, so you'll have seen most of those things, but one or two things just to highlight. Uh, we have been asked by the church at central level to highlight again to folks just because uh, of the way things are that if we do have any symptoms of uh, the COVID-19 that we, we don't come to church and that we continue to, as we are doing, uh, wear our masks, hand sanitising and the social distancing measures. Unfortunately there are some who would be agitating for the churches to be closed again so we, we want to do everything possible to keep our church open but also to keep ourselves and everyone else safe as we do so. Midweek this incoming week will be in Sandholes and then as the slides were saying also Next week is the last opportunity to return or to bring back a shoe box. And we want to encourage you to fill shoe boxes and bring them uh, back so that others can be helped this Christmas season. Next Sunday is Remembrance Sunday. There'll be no evening service or special evening service will not be on, but we will have an act of remembrance here in the morning service. Uh, and, and that will be um, uh, a bigger part of our no morning service than normally would be. So we encourage you to come for that and uh, I would also want to encourage you to um, come prepared to be generous maybe more generous than normal uh, to the, the offering for the Earl Haig Fund since the poppy collectors haven't been able to get out on a round this year uh, uh, the poppy sellers rather with their boxes of poppies uh, and there will be a loss of income there for uh, the Earl Haig Fund so let, let us help to, to make a little bit of difference by our offerings next week and then again, as was on the slide, thank you very much for your generosity uh, to the Food Bank Appeal. Um, Andrew and I had a, two car loads of stuff to take in to Dungannon uh, during the week. It was very well received, very much appreciated, so thank you very much indeed. Now, um, as we come to worship God, we hear these words from Revelation chapter 1. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins... To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. We come today to acknowledge, to remember the one who, who gave himself to free us from our sins. Let us glorify him in our worship today. And so let's join together to pray. Gracious Saviour, we come humbly before you knowing that nothing is hidden from your searching gaze. Like Peter of old, we say, O oh Lord, you know all things. And we know that is true, O oh God, that everything is, is naked and open before your eye. We can hide nothing from you. You know all our faults and failings and all our sins, as well as the, those good things about us. And yet you love us and have given your son for us and we praise you and we ask for grace that we might truly love you, that we might love you more and more each day. Lord, we admit that we are our people with divided hearts. A battle rages within us day after day, the flesh battling against the spirit, the old sinful nature battling against the new nature in Christ. And so that oftentimes longing to know you better, we are afraid to pursue that because of what it might require. And striving to do your will, we often yet choose to do our own. Seeking your guidance, but inwardly preferring our own direction. O oh Lord, we realize sin and temptation are always with us, and when we think we are winning on that front, often one cunning bosom sin undoes it all. And so we repent of our sin right now, O Lord, and plead for mercy. 
Forgive us, cleanse us, restore us. We pray with the hymn writer, your kingdom come, O God. Your rule, O Christ, begin. Break with your iron rod the tyrannies of sin. May that be so in our hearts and in our lives, O God. We ask that you would direct our thoughts now, O Lord, away from self and unto you. And unto the symbols laid out before us today. Symbols that speak of that Passover in Egypt long ago. And also of that supper in Jerusalem. When the master, the Lord Jesus, first spoke with his disciples about the body broken and blood shed. So lead us by your spirit and remind us that what we celebrate today is a festival of joy. The transformation from slavery to freedom, from darkness to light, from bondage to redemption. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us join together now to sing our opening hymn. Uh, two verses of My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness. We will remain seated for uh, this hymn. My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness. <laughs> And surely that is true of us today as we gather in this place. That our hearts are filled with thankfulness to the Lord for his grace. For all that he has accomplished for us. We turn now to Exodus chapter 12 for our uh, scripture reading. Exodus chapter 12 and beginning at verse 1. As we continue uh, our journey with God as he unfolds his big story throughout all of scripture and isn't it interesting in the sovereignty of God that we come on just today to Exodus chapter 12 that speaks about the sacrifice and bloodshed. Exodus chapter 12 and beginning to read at verse 1 let us hear God's word. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the house is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbour next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. 
You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted with fire, with unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted with fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning. And what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus shall you eat it. With your belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night. And will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. Both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Amen. Finish at verse 13. And we thank God for his word and pray that he will indeed bless his word uh, to all our hearts. Uh, today. And so I want to come and share uh, from God's word, from that passage of scripture, particularly uh, just now at this point in our service. <clears throat> and so it is that in God's big story in the Bible, we have come to that point where God rescues his people from Egypt. This is the big salvation story of the Old Testament. And it teaches us how God will save his people through Jesus. Always bear that in mind, folks, when you read this. This is pointing forward. This is a picture of something even greater still that is to come in the future for them, for us, which, which is in, in now in the past. Jesus' sacrifice. God came down, as we noticed uh, last week, I think it was, uh, and he chose Moses to go and lead his people out of Egypt, out of, of slavery. Moses obeyed, reluctantly uh, initially, of course, but Moses obeyed. He went to Egypt and he said to Pharaoh, God says, let my people go. We know Pharaoh didn't listen, but instead he, he became even more cruel and harsh against the children of Israel, heaping greater burdens on them uh, and, and making life difficult for them. And so God sent many plagues, or we could call them judgments, upon Egypt. But Pharaoh still did not let pe God's people go. Time after time after time, God gave him the opportunity, and each time he refused. And so now we have come to that point for the, the point in the time. For the last judgment, God's angel will go through the land of Egypt and will kill every firstborn son, the eldest child in every home in Egypt. And then Pharaoh will let the Israelites go. But there's a big question here for us. Will the children of Israel be safe when this judgment comes? And the answer is this, only, only if they kill a lamb, as we have been reading, and apply its blood to their doorposts, the blood of the lamb will keep them safe. So again, we notice that in chapter 3, we, we saw how God comes down. He's not, doesn't remain aloof and far removed, but God actually came down to his people to save them. And in chapter 12, now, we see how God saves through sacrifice. And the main thing that this chapter is saying to us, I think that, that I would like us to, to take on board and hold on to is this. We should trust God's sacrifice. Jesus. They trusted in that little lamb. 
we should trust in God's sacrifice of Jesus. It will keep you safe from God's judgment. It will keep you safe from God's judgment. So that said, by way of introduction, there are three things that we're going to notice today. First of all, God judges sin. Secondly, God protects sinners. And thirdly, God feeds his people. And so as we come to this first point then, God judges sin, we, we see it, it mentioned in, in, in verse 12 there about it. We notice here what is happening is that Pharaoh is fighting against God. He's been fighting and railing against God for, for such a long time. God has warned him many times, given him many opportunities to repent, uh, but he refuses to listen to anything that God says, uh, especially through his servant Moses. You see, Pharaoh thinks that there is no one who is more powerful than him. He doesn't think even that the God of the Hebrews is more powerful than than him. He thinks he is the last word in power and in authority. He rules such a vast domain and he thinks he's untouchable. But at midnight God will go through all of Egypt and find every firstborn son there and each one, each firstborn son dies. What is God doing? He is, this seems a terrible, terrible thing, doesn't it? But God is executing judgment on Egypt because of Egypt's sin. Egypt has been a, a very sinful nation. Pharaoh is a sinful ruler who rejects God and God's ways and indeed God's people. And God is executing judgment. Each of the plagues, in fact, that God sent right up to this point was a judgment against one of those false gods of Egypt. But indeed in this final play, God is executing judgment on all the gods of Egypt. Let me read the latter part of verse 12 again. I'll read the whole verse actually. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And listen to this bit. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. You see, God showed the people of Egypt here that their many gods were no good to them. They couldn't protect anyone against God's punishment. I am the Lord, he says, not Pharaoh and not any of these false gods that you put your trust in. The God of the Israelites. He is Lord. That's what God is saying here through his judgments. And particularly through this final judgment. He showed them who the true God is. God came and judged sin. But what we need to recognize today here is that God is our judge also. And just like not one single firstborn son of Egypt could hide from God, we cannot hide from God either. God warns us repeatedly as he warned Pharaoh and his people of the need to listen to him, to obey him, to follow his way. God is very patient with us as he was with Pharaoh. He gives us opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to repent. And to trust in him and to be his faithful followers. And perhaps, uh, like the Egyptians, uh, we feel that um, God's not really going to worry all that much about us and we're not really that much the focus of his attention and we can get off with whatever we want to do but no we need to realize that one day God is coming to judge sin let me read what it says in Romans 2 5 and 6 Paul speaking says but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitence of heart. See the, the connection here with Pharaoh again and his hardness of heart. 
God says to the, the, the Romans, but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitence of heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds. If we refuse, like Pharaoh, to trust in the Lord God as our God and our Saviour, we are storing up God's wrath and judgment for a day yet to be revealed when God will come in judgment. And so this passage in Romans explains that when we disobey God, we are storing up his anger against us. However, and I'm glad there's a however. However, there is one way to be safe. And that brings us to our second point. is this, that God protects sinners. You see, the Israelites have also sinned. Not just the Egyptians. The Israelites are, are not perfect either. In the past, they had not trusted God as they ought. Uh, they have lived their own lives, their own way in many instances also, and they deserve God to judge them too. They do. But God tells them of a way to be safe. And that way is outlined throughout uh, Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through to 20, and so on. We didn't read all of those verses today, but that way is outlined there for them. And they can be safe, as I said, through the blood of the Lamb. And we, we know the story. We've just read it there. On the tenth day of the month, the Israelites were to take a lamb. One lamb per household, or, or a lamb between two households, if the households weren't big enough uh, for, for one lamb. The lamb must be without blemish. Without defect. Uh, it says that in verse 5. Um, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, and so on. It must not be a weak lamb or a, an old lamb. It must not be blind or lame or anything like that. It cannot be a, a lamb that um, is of no value to you. It must be without defect. And that means a lamb that has absolutely nothing wrong with it. A, a, a perfect and a good lamb. Not, as I say, one of little value. Not one that perhaps was sick and was going to die in a couple of days' time anyway. Uh, and one that you wouldn't really miss. But a good lamb. This is to be a sacrifice. Costly. Only the best lamb will do. And this again reminds us of Jesus, the Lamb of God. He gave the best as a sacrifice for us. And they were to keep this lamb until the 14th day of the month. And then at sunset, at sunset they, they were to kill the lamb. And then they were told to do something that to us seems a very strange thing. They were to sprinkle or daub some of that lamb's blood on the door frame of their houses, on the sides and across the top. Yes, they were to put the blood of the lamb around the door and stay inside and the blood of the lamb protected them not because there was something magical uh, or special in any way about the blood of the lamb but simply because they trusted and obeyed god this was god's way to protect them god's way to save them and they believed god they trusted in what god said and they did it they obeyed and that's what's important for us not that um, we go through uh, rituals or rites, but that we trust God's word and we respond in obedience to what God asks us or calls us to do. Why did the Israelites need to sacrifice a lamb? Because, as I said, even though they were the people of God, they had been 
under great duress in Egypt. They had cried out to God. They hadn't always followed God or remained close to God. But now in their distress, they certainly they cry out to God. And God hears their cry. And God has come to rescue them. But they, like the Egyptians, though they were the people of God, they were sinners also. And we might call ourselves the people of God, but we are sinners today as well. And that's why they needed to sacrifice the lamb. The lamb died instead of the son, instead of the firstborn. This is, as I say, what the Bible calls a sacrifice. And, and sacrifices taught God's people important truths about God. They were like pictures for the children of Israel. They didn't all have Bibles as we have in those days. And there was a lot of picture language and a lot of symbolism to help them to remember important truths. And, and this, the sacrifices taught them important truths. When Israel worshipped God, they always had to kill an animal. And then it was burnt on an altar. This didn't really give God any great joy because God uh, uh, doesn't like to see death of any kind, even of an animal. But as I say, the sacrifices were necessary to teach. And they taught two big lessons. And the first is this. Sin deserves death. Sin separates us from God. Remember what happened after the first sin of Adam and Eve? God sent them away from him, out of his garden, out of his presence, away from his presence. Because sin had brought a barrier, a separation between them. Isaiah 59 and verse 2 says, But your, your iniquity has separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face so that he will not hear Sin separates from God. And that separation ultimately is, is death. Eternal death. There is only one way back to God. Sin must be paid for. And oh folks, the price, the price is very great. It is death. That is why Israel had to sacrifice animals every day. It was a picture to teach them. It was a reminder to them that they sinned every day. And so every day there had to be death to pay for that sin. And only then could they be restored to friendship with God. So that's the first lesson that the sacrifice teaches. Sin deserves death. The second one is this, that sinners need a sacrifice. The animal hadn't sinned. The animal didn't sin. The people sinned. They were the sinners who deserved death, but the animal died in the place of the people. And so the sacrifices uh, that they had to perform taught the Israelites that that sacrifice, that animal that died, was in their place, died in their place. They needed someone else to die so that they would not have to. And that's exactly why God sent the Lord Jesus into our world, so that he could die in our place so that we would not have to this event that we are talking about in Exodus chapter 12 is, is called Passover because God saw the blood of those doorposts and lintels and he passed over those who were protected by the death of another as verse 13 tells us um, if I can get my I, now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. God saw the blood, and he passed over those who were protected by the death of another, that lamb. God kept them safe. And then he told them that they were to eat the Passover every meal, every year, as a reminder. But not only was it a reminder of God's redemption for them, but the Lamb was also a pointer. It pointed forward, as I said, to the Lamb of God. 
And that's the wonderful truth for us today as we come again around the Lord's table. It'll be done differently uh, than we normally do it. But uh, nonetheless, as we come to the Lord's Supper today, we remember another lamb, don't we? And this lamb was a pointer to the greater lamb. And to the, this, the sacrifice of this little lamb was a pointer to a greater sacrifice that was to come. Yes, there is a way for us to be safe from God's judgment. John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold, the Lamb of God. This man that you see walking among you, he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, Jesus came to be our sacrifice. Jesus is our, the believer's, Passover Lamb. When did Jesus die? At Passover. That was symbolic also, wasn't it? And the Lord's Supper is our Passover meal. Like the lamb at Passover, Jesus was not a sinner. He did not deserve to die, but he did die for sinners like me and you. And so the way to be safe is to hide under his blood. The blood of the lamb makes us safe. First Peter chapter 1 uh, verses uh, 18 and 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers but, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. His blood was shed for us. Oh, how could the blood of an animal really equate to a human being? But that little animal just pointed to the sacrifice of Jesus for us. His blood was shed. To redeem us from destruction. And Jesus' death was the last sacrifice. There was no need of any further sacrifices after that. And there is no other sacrifice to protect you or I from God's anger. And becoming a Christian really is asking Jesus to be your lamb that died for your sin. And then God's judgment will not come on you but he will pass over you because you are covered as it were by his blood just like they were covered and protected by the blood of the little lamb and that is why we delight today surely to participate in the Lord's Supper it reminds us that Jesus has taken our place and died our death to save us from God's judgment Yes, yes, God judges sin, of course he does, but God protects sinners. He has offered the blood of his own son, the Lord Jesus, to protect us from his judgment. And we will be protected if we trust and believe in him. And finally, God feeds his people. You see, God did not only keep his people safe, but he fed them. The Passover lamb that protected them also fed them. The food that they received from that lamb gave them strength for the journey out of Egypt. God saved them to begin a new life with him. And he nourished them and prepared them for that journey. And Jesus did not only die to save us from God's judgment, but he died to give us new life, eternal life. And he has provided for us all that is needed to sustain us in that new life. Jesus is the Lamb of God. And he is also the bread of life. Isn't he? Jesus is the Lamb of God. And the bread of life. As I close, listen to what John says, or rather what Jesus says in John's Gospel, chapter 6 and verse 53 and following. 
Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day, for my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Now Jesus is not talking about cannibalism. He's not talking about literal flesh and blood. And, and these elements that we have before us today, they are not turned into the little, literal body and blood of Christ. Jesus is talking symbolically. Jesus is saying that as we come to him, as we feed upon his word, as we are led by his spirit, that he feeds and nourishes us spiritually. And indeed as we come around the Lord's table, we are spiritually nourished. Even in the participation of the elements that are set before us. And so as we trust him, he feeds us with everything that we need. And he will safely one day bring us home to God. We praise God for his goodness, his love and his mercy, that though he judges sin, he protects sinners. He gives us a way to be safe, his son. He feeds and nourishes us along that journey, which is the Christian life, provides all that we need. Let's pause to pray. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your word that strengthens and nourishes us and for the, indeed, the, the nourishment that we will get, spiritually speaking, through participation in your supper today. We ask that in these days you would strengthen the faith of, of the church at large, that you would increase her courage and restore her witness in these trying times that we live in, times when there are many who, who reel against you and against your church, O oh God, uh, and would seek to destroy the church. Help us to be faithful witnesses. Strengthen us for that task, we pray. And even in the midst of the, the, the coronavirus uh, situation, Lord, which has turned our lives upside down in a sense, that you would be with the church and help her to be faithful, a faithful witness through it all. We pray, O oh God, for our own congregation, that you would deepen our fellowship together, you would enlarge our understanding of you and all you want us to know, and you would widen our vision for the work of your kingdom. We pray for Her Majesty the Queen, for her, her, her government and all who rule over us in these days. We pray for those in industry, those in education, those in the health service and all the caring professions, especially today those who are dealing with and tackling and confronting COVID-19. Give them your help, O oh God, we pray. Give them your, your wisdom. Give them your strength. Give them success, O oh Lord, we pray. We pray today for all who are in need, the poor and the lonely, the anxious and the worried, the sick, and the dying and, and all who suffer in any way and especially those connected with our own congregation Lord who need you we pray that you will prove to be our all in all as we would look to you may each of us through your spirit triumph in Christ as we did on Calvary in Jesus name we pray Amen now we're going to have a little change from what we've been doing this last wee while in that we are going to sing this next hymn rather than Alison just playing a piece because it's, it's really a part of our service and uh, uh, very important to think that we would sing it. So, And I think also I, I will ask you to stand just to give you an opportunity to move your position as we sing this uh, hymn. Uh, Psalm 116 verses 13 to 19. I lost salvation, take the cup.
Now, dear folks, as we are about to celebrate the Holy Communion of the Body and the Blood of Christ, let us pause to consider how St. Paul exhorts all persons to examine themselves before they eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For the benefit is great indeed if with a truly penitent heart and living faith we receive that holy sacrament. For then we spiritually eat the flesh of Christ and drink his blood. Then we dwell in Christ and Christ in us as Jesus said in John's Gospel. But so is the danger great if we receive the same unworthily. For the one who eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks judgment to himself not discerning the Lord's body. And therefore we urge you not to come to this table unworthily, not to bring this table into disrespect or indeed bring his judgment upon yourself. Rather, we pray that you would examine your own conscience to know whether you have truly repented of your sins and whether trusting in God's mercy and seeking your whole salvation in Jesus Christ you resolve to live a life of holiness and to live in peace and love with all men. If you have this testimony in your heart before God, be assured that your sins are forgiven through that perfect merit of Jesus Christ our Lord. And you are therefore welcome in his name at his holy table. And we have then the words now of the institution of the Lord's Supper as given to us in 1 Corinthians by the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let's give thanks to God as we bow again in prayer. Let's pray. Almighty and eternal God, we thank you that you have made us in your image and likeness. We rejoice that you have loved us, that you have loved indeed the world so much that you sent your Son to earth for our salvation. And so we remember with thankfulness his birth, his life, and that by his death and resurrection he has brought life and immortality to life. With thanksgiving we declare that by him we have received liberty and eternal life. By him we have access to your presence. By him we have adoption into your family and become joint heirs with him of all the riches of your grace. We come to this table not because we are strong, but because we are weak, not because we are worthy of ourselves, but because of his worthiness, because of the righteousness of Christ extended to us. We come because Christ loved us, and gave himself for us. And we pray now that by your Holy Spirit, that in receiving these elements of bread and wine, they may be for us the communion of the body and the blood of Jesus. Amen. And so according to the holy institution, example and command of our Lord Jesus, and as a memorial to him, we do this. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me.
Lamb of God. He takes away the sin of the word. Have mercy upon us and grant us your peace. Now you have noticed already that the format of our service is different today. I haven't been able to come down to the table. The elders not able to gather around the table with me. They will not be serving the bread and the wine to you, but each one will have received one of these little cups as you have come into church, which we have done our best to lay out for you in a safe way. Um, and there, as you noticed probably earlier in the service as well, or before the service began when the announcements were up, there are two little C's here. Peel back the top one, and that reveals a little piece of bread. And then uh, peel back the bottom one, a bit like one of those little um, milk carton things you would get on an airplane or so on, and that reveals the wine underneath. So uh, let us then uh, peel back that first layer, and uh, we will have the piece of bread all together. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. We are truly thankful to God that his son gave up his body to be beaten and broken for us and to be hanged on that cross and shed his blood so that we could be covered and protected from God's wrath and judgment and inherit eternal life through faith and trust in him. And for this opportunity to come around the Lord's table and participate uh, in the elements today and we pray that we might indeed be spiritually nourished through this service as Paul says now I urge you in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice let us pray gracious God we thank you for the love which brings us food from heaven the life of your dear Son, to nurture all his faithful people both in heaven and on earth. Now we ask that you would receive the offerings of our lives and our money to be used in your eternal purpose in this congregation and beyond. And may the virtues of Christ be increasingly seen in us. Help us to abide in Christ, ever sensitive to his guidance and obedient his leading and grant that strengthened by this fellowship and by the power of his Holy Spirit we may continue his work in the world until we come to glory the glory of your eternal kingdom we ask and pray these things through Jesus Christ your son Amen, Amen. we will stand again for our closing hymn a God of grace amazing wonder irresistible and free, oh, the miracle of mercy, Jesus reaches down to me. <coughs>
forth in the peace of Christ to serve him in the world. And now that God, that God the Father who loved you before the foundation of the world, the Son who set you free and made you his slave, and the Counselor who stands by you forever, give you ears to hear him, hearts to crave him, and lives that reflect him. Amen. Amen.